Hey guys, it's me the mayor again, and today I review a very very special carbine. It's a lever action and it's been used by deer hunters for about over a hundred years already. It is the Winchester Model 94 and this one has been chambered in 30 WCF. Now the 30 WCF name, it's very strange because the 3030 is the exact same as the 30 WCF but the main difference is is that the 3030 name was actually designated by the Marlin Corporation and for some strange reason 3030 was a more popular uh, name in itself over the 30 WCF. People just seem to like it better. Now this, ri this rifle ended the uh, lever gun era of rifles. Before this it was the, the 1892 and the 1892 was meant more for you know smokeless powder and uh, they also made it in pistol and rifle caliber car cartridges. But when they came up with a 94, they designed it from the start to, you know, be able to take the stronger pressures of the smokeless powders. Now, this weapon was actually originally chambered for 3240 and 3855. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, it was the first rifle to chamber a smokeless round. So that means more power, you know, also not a big cloud of smoke when you shot it. You know, like the old cowboy shooters with the 45 long Colt black powder rounds. Alrighty, now we can go ahead and dive into this rifle's history a little bit more. Back in 1894, this was probably the most technologically advanced carbine that anyone could buy at the time. Use smokeless powder. You know, a big plus, of course, for power and also concealability of your fire uh, placement. And on top of that, the action was stronger than the 1892. You can see it's a full frame model. Some of these 94s were ordered in takedown models, but that wasn't later on until about after World War I. And the funny thing is about World War I is that the U.S. military, or the U.S. Army actually, ordered 1800 of these rifles. And they were marked with a bomb and the U.S. stamps for the Army Signal Corps. And they were used as kind of like patrol rifles to secure timber because they were cutting down timber to fuel the war effort. This personal example is actually in the 1 millionth, 100 thousandth uh, serial number. And that means that it was actually made right on 1942, right when the United States was getting started in the Second World War. Now, a lot of people may have think, you know, may be thinking, wow, you know, what a nice cowboy shooter, you know. It looks as cowboys can be, but to tell you the truth, the cowboy era was actually ending by the time this rifle came out. The 1892 was a lot more popular, you know, before this model came out. But, you know, just for the fact that it was, you know, smokeless, or smoked powder, actually. You know, black powder. Because not everybody could afford smokeless at the time. Smokeless was a new technology. Kind of, you know, kind of like polymer, you know, polymer cased ammunition or, you know, like a caseless ammunition nowadays. It was kind of an experimental technology, but it caught on and everybody started using it. Now, for all you John Wayne lovers out there, he actually did not use the 1894, you know, in all of his movies. You know, it looks like the same rifle, but it's actually not. The, mo the rifle that he used in most of his movies was the 1892 model with the uh, smoked powder, you know, the black powder. He only used this rifle in two of his movies, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance and also The Sons of Katie Elder. Now, Katie Elder was the woman who hung around Doc Holliday a lot, so I can just imagine what type of trouble those two guys got into. Mechanism of this rifle is lever action, fed through a tube underneath the barrel, right here. There's a barrel band to keep it all straight, all in place. See, there's like a little loading flipper up here that flips it up from the tube into firing position into the chamber. Now there's an old saying, load it once, shoot all week. And that is because the tube itself holds six rounds and the chamber holds seven, so you can shoot it one day per week. <laughs> you know, kind of nifty, but it's a very, very old saying. It's a hammer design, you know, not striker fired like, you know, as most bolt actions are. And also on top of that, it has a sight setup. This is for a dovetail sight, and the front sight post is right back here. It's just a standard, you know, dot post raised up a little bit you know with the dovetail mount but this is actually a special custom ordered one that came with a Lyman sight on it and that Lyman sight is a 56A sight here's where the sight says Lyman on it and um, this is a 56A model now this sight is actually aluminum 
and it's kind of strange, you know, that they use aluminum, but it was a little bit lighter weight, you know, and a little bit easier to carry than a steel version. Now here you have your course adjustment, right here. Up here you have a little set screw, that's your set stop. And that sets your, when you sight in your rifle, you put the set screw at the bottom, you know, resting on the bottom of the frame. Now this is your adjustment plane. This is your uh, elevation adjustment. This is your windage adjustment. And these peep sights can actually be changed out for a larger or a smaller diameter hole, depending on what the shooter likes. In the front here, we have just a standard bead sight. You know, nothing too fancy here. But the peep sight, you know, according to most shooters, was actually a little bit easier to get the hang of instead of the standard, you know, dovetail notch sight back here. And also you get a longer, you know, a longer radius with the peep sight. This rifle also has some interesting safeties. Here you can cock it back to half cock and you can still manipulate the lever, but it does not open the bolt. Also, this little notch right here at the bottom of the uh, of the pistol grip forearm, well it's not technically a pistol grip, but it is, you know, the stock of the weapon. That is also a safety. When the lever is fully depressed, then you can actually pull the trigger on full cock mode. Make sure that there's no round in the chamber. Now we must test. Now, when it is actually fully cocked back, and the lever is out of sync, it will not fire. Unless if it is contacting this external safety. Cutting the cost production of this rifle is what ultimately led to the demise of the Winchester 1894. Now, John Olin actually bought Winchester in 1944, you know, um, close to the end of the war. And on top of that, um, he was actually, you know, still making Winchesters in the traditional manner of milling out the receivers, making all the parts, you know, milled, and, um, you know, none, none of the parts were cast or, you know, made out of cheap blanks. And, well, the time came that he had to retire, and in 1963, John Olin retired from the corporation, and also, new CEOs, of course, took over production. Now, this is what's considered the 1964 Winchester 94s. Now, the 1964 Winchester 94s were made very, very crudely compared to the Winchester's pre-64s. Now, this change was brought on, you know, just to cut costs in a way, you know, just to save money. And the CEOs, they went ahead and they ceased, you know, milling out the frame, of course, and the small parts, and they switched to just casting out of sinistered steel. Now, the one bad thing about that is that, you know, it can leave a lot of voids in the casts. And, you know, back then we knew this, and that's why we didn't really... You know, uh, arms manufacturers didn't really do this technique. You know, nowadays it's a little bit better, and you can cast stuff a lot easier and, you know, with less imperfections, but still, there are some imperfections. And structurally, the steel is still not as solid as a milled receiver. <clears throat> Another strange change that they did was the cartridge lifter back here. You know, the little flipper was actually pressed out of a piece of sheet metal instead of traditionally milled out. You know, that was a really big no-no at the time, and they were getting complaints of some bent uh, cartridge lifters. And also, a lot of the roll pins were changed to hollow roll pins. I mean, that's just crazy stuff. You know, it's just cutting the cost by, you know, like a cent here or there, but that cent really does, you know, add up in the long run on the, you know, reliability and the longevity of the firearm itself. Now, in 1892, it was redesigned to actually eject the shells to the right. You know, if you're using a scope or whatnot, the shells, they eject up in the standard uh, 1894 configuration. If I can go ahead and get it to work here. Empty shell case. Alrighty. See, it went straight up right there. Now it was changed to eject out of the right hand side because a lot of shooters they didn't like these peep sights and the iron sights you know they were starting to get old so what they did was they started putting you know side mounted scopes that went straight over the bore now these lever actions you know of course were ejecting through the top and people really didn't like that so in 1982 they changed the design altogether so that way it would actually eject to the right hand side
The end of this iconic lever action was mainly brought upon by the caliber. You know, the 3030 fell out of favor, and now the 308 and the 30 out 6 are, you know, mainly the rounds used for medium sized game nowadays. Also, 243 Winchester. You know, you cannot load um, pointed bullets in the tube, so it was at a ballistic disadvantage. And also, a lot of shooters, when they're prone and they have to cycle the lever, the, the lever gets in the way while they are laying prone. Now, in 1992, that's when U.S. repeating arms became completely bankrupt, and they were bought by FN, Belgians, of course. And the FNs actually did something right for once. They milled everything out, the receiver, the small parts, everything was CNC uh, machined which was actually really nice. But they did one thing wrong that nobody liked. They put a lawyer safety on the back of the tang. Now the lawyer safety did a lot of things and it was mainly uh, angering to the consumer. You see the consumer likes the simplicity but the lawyer safety was just that added you know uh, added technicality safety for FN so that way they wouldn't get sued by accidental discharges or negligent users. American production ceased completely in 2006. And now all 94s are actually produced by Moroku in Japan. It's a company, a Japanese company producing American rifles. It's crazy. It happens. And I really do wish that an American manufacturer would make a true to spec 94 clone that ejects out the top without a safety and is all CNC machined and milled. Now, the positives of this weapon, you know, it's a very good brush gun. Ballistic similar to the AK round, if not a little bit more powerful with a heavier green bullet. Sights are good on the Lyman sights. You know, the ghost peep sight is really nice. I really love it. And also on top of that, you know, it's a really handy little 20-inch carbine. I mean, you can't really beat it. Yeah, it's a little heavy, yes, but it makes up for it in recoil reduction and also maneuverability. You can, you know, whip this thing around and the receiver is so short, you know. The action actually comes outside of the receiver. See? So it shortens up the gun a little bit. And uh, a standard receiver with a 20 inch barrel would be, you know, about another 6 to 7 inches longer. So, in the end, this is actually a very nice brush hunting carbine. Very good for, you know, feral pigs or any type of pest species. And on top of that, you know, it's a, um, it's a tribute to the end of the Wild Wild West era. Alright guys, that's the mayor. Thanks for watching. And by the way, when's the last time that you saw a Monarch barks like this? 30-30 Winchester, 170 grain flat points, costing $6.86. <laughs> Alright guys, that's the mayor. Thanks for watching.